We will be focusing on the book of Jude, the book of Judah, this morning, just that one chapter book before Revelation. That's where our focus uh, would be tonight. And we'll focus on verse 20 and verse 21. So let's pray before we move on into reading the word of God. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful tonight. We are so thankful, Lord, for who you are. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our words, Heavenly Father, would not even begin to describe who you are. Hence, there's a song that talks of you being indescribable, uncontainable. And tonight we feel that way, Lord, that our words do not even begin to express the way you are in a true sense of who you are. So, gracious Father, we want to appreciate you tonight for the unconditional love that you have, you have lavished upon our lives so that in you, O oh Lord, we would have our salvation founded. So, great God, even tonight, as we are about to, to, to continue preaching your word, we pray for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we will be dealing with the book of Judah, that your love would most definitely be felt, and we would continue loving you as we should be. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, the theme tonight is, uh, is simple. Just keep yourself, keep yourself in the love of God, or keep yourselves in the love of God. You'll see that in verse 21. The two verses read as follows. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Let, let, me, let me start by maybe asking us a question tonight. What, what would you do if somebody would come to you after a Sunday service or evening service or during the week? They come to you, you know, seeking for counseling. And they, they tell you this, that you know what? The passion that I had for the Lord has diminished. The passion that I had for the Lord, you know, has really gone down big time. What would you advise the person or what counsel would you give to the person? Is somebody that you know, this person really has been, you know, very active in the church and they have been participating in so many different things in the church, but they come to you after the service and say, listen, listen, brother or sister, you know what, the passion that I had for God seemed to be going down. What would you do to help that particular person? And I believe tonight from the book of Judah, in these two verses, we, we will see what to do. And much more, you know, what I appreciate about this is more from when you look at what Pastor Joseph preached about, more especially the book of John. John was dealing with false teachers. And this is the very same thing that we see in the book of Judah. Judah is dealing with the same, false teachers. But it was mainly in the um, initial stage. Because you would see as you read in the book of Judah, as you read verses 3 and 4, and I think we can read from verses 3 and 4. Judah says this, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to all saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designed for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sexuality and deny our Lord, our only Master and Lord, 
Jesus Christ. This is what we are seeing here. Judah had a purpose. He wanted to write a letter. Maybe the letter, you know, could have been something like maybe the book of Romans or the book of Philip, the book of Ephesians. But he decided to say, you know what, there's an urgent need that needs to be dealt with within the church. Because there are people who crept into the church unnoticed. And these people are doing this. They are perverting the grace of God. And they are denying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are denying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as you go on, because what Judah does in this book, you know, he tells us, okay, he tells believers, believers, this is what you need to do, contenting, fighting for the faith. But he spends much of his time explaining why should they take place. He spent much of his time, because if you look from verses 4 to verse 19, he is explaining that why that should, why that is important. Why is that fundamental for the church to stand up and fight, to stand up and contend for the faith? And we read that in verse number 4, that certain people have crept in unnoticed. These people are doing what? Perverting the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are denying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as you go on in verse number 8 as well, yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams. These are people who are relying on their dreams. They are not relying on the word of God. Defiles the flesh. Rejecting authority, which is the word of God. And you continue as well, looking at verse number 10. Self-deceptive. That's what you see from this. These are gramblers. People who are grumbling. And you continue reading that they are malcontent. People who are not satisfied with the revealed will of the Lord. They are not satisfied with what is revealed in Scripture. These people are relying on their dreams. The Bible has got nothing to do with their life whatsoever. As you continue reading as well in verse number 16, arrogant speakers who are self-seeking, showing favoritism. And you continue reading as well in verse number 18. These are scoffers, 19, causing division, Worldly minded, devoid of the Holy Spirit. This is the profile being given of these people. And Judah saying, the church, come on. Let's face the reality. Let's fight for our faith. And the reason being, there are people who came into the church and these people are doing what? Denying our Lord Jesus Christ. These people are denying authority. The word of God is not their authority. These people are relying on dreams. So surely the gospel here is being denied. But no, what is so amazing as you come to verse number 20 and verse 21, Judah is not even telling the believers, you know, how to deal with these false teachers. He's not telling them, you know what, you know how to deal with these people? Just kick them out of the church. He's not even telling them that. He's not even telling them that. Because as you go, as you continue, after answering the question, why should the church step in and fight for the faith? Then he continues to say, to answer the question, how? And how he's answering them that is bringing in the command, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is what he's telling the, he's telling the church. You don't have to carry shambo, you don't have to carry, you know, weapons to fight against these people, but do this as a church. You know the temptation sometimes as a church when we are facing all these things that are happening, and Pastor Joseph was so clear that if there's a time where we need people who will stand firm on the word of God, it is our time and age. It is our time and age. But Judah is not even worried about that. He's not saying, guys, go on, fight these guys and all that. But he focuses on the church and says, church, this is how you respond to false teachers. And the way you respond to false teachers is by keeping yourself in the love of God. It's by keeping yourself in the love of God. 
And this is what we are going to see tonight. I'm not sure if I would be able to deal with all three points or three means here, but we are going to see three means on how to deal with false teachers or how to keep ourselves in the love of God. Three means on how to keep ourselves in the love of God, keeping ourselves aware, our hearts quite passionate for the, for, for the gospel, our heart passionate for God. Because it's just contrasting that you look at the first thing here, it's a daily appropriation of the gospel, daily appropriation of the gospel. If you are to keep yourself in the love of God, you see there, the first thing that you see, building yourself up in your, holy, in your most holy faith. That's how you keep yourself in the love of God. Responsibilities of what we should do as believers. And notice this. If you look at how he's responding to this, this is in contrast with what these guys are doing. They are not building, they are doing what, if you look at verse number 19, they are causing division in the church. But what we are told as children of God is to make sure that we keep ourselves in the love of God. And how do we do that? By building ourselves up in our most holy faith. That's what we need to do. And let me, let me, let me show you this. If you also look at the word being used, building up in your most holy faith, you look at this. This is like an active participle. Active participle. And one other thing that you should realize as well about it, it is more in an imperative sense. It is like an imperative. It is not optional. If we are to keep ourselves in the love of God as the church of God, what we need to do, it is not optional to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. That's not an option. And one other thing, look at this. It is also continuous. Meaning, the building cannot, we cannot depend on the experience of yesterday. This is something that has to happen on a daily basis. It's not something that we can stand and say, you know what, I depend, I know well I've been reflecting on the gospel uh, yesterday, I've been reflecting on the gospel last week, then today I've got, you know, be some uh, carriers for this week. Even if I don't reflect on the gospel this week, it's okay. No, that's not it. This is a daily thing that we should be doing as a church. Building ourselves up in our most holy faith. It's not a once-off. This is not like transferring money in the bank whereby it will give you option. Do you want to go for once-off or what? what? Then you say once-off. This is not a once-off type of a deal. This is a daily thing that as a believer, if you want to grow in your faith, this is what you do. Brothers and sisters, there's no neutral state in our Christianity whereby you'd remain in one place and say, you know what, this is where I am and I'm good with the Lord. Not at all. There's nothing of that nature. It is a continuous thing that we need to do, I and you. And you'd as well know this, for a building to be there, there has to be a foundation, right? For a building to be there, we need a foundation. We need a foundation for a building to be there. And if you look at this, as the language, you know, Paul uses this language a lot, the language of buildings and all that. And if you reflect in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, you read these words. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is there. Paul did not design the foundation. Look at that. He did not design the foundation. He only laid down the foundation as he was preaching Christ and him crucified. That is the foundation upon which we have to build one another on a daily basis. That is the foundation upon which the church has to be Build on a daily basis. If we are to keep ourselves aware, if we are to keep our passion alive towards the Lord, 
this is what we need to do, building ourselves on a daily basis, on the foundation of the gospel, on the foundation who is Jesus Christ. Then if the church reaches the point whereby we are missing the gospel, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. That is why the church has to remain strong in its affirmation of the gospel. Because you read this as well in second, not, not second, but Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers, and, and you're no longer strangers, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of that. He is the cornerstone of that. So you need to note that faith is indeed a proclamation of Christ who died for our sins and who calls us all to repentance. We must note that this faith is the most holy faith. It is set apart it is from God himself. Anything to do with God is described as holy, and faith comes from God himself. Judah is calling believers to go back to fighting for what has been revealed. He's calling them to fighting for what has been revealed. The call to build yourself up is addressed in the context of those who are true believers. It is an appeal to the church, the body of Christ, the work to work together in the process of commitment to the study of the truth revealed in Scripture. The New Testament elsewhere puts Christ as the role of the foundation of the church, and we rest on him alone for salvation. We rest on him alone for salvation. Brothers, let me say this, by the way, maybe of applying this first point here. What we need to understand as a church of God is this. If we are to build each other, we cannot look anywhere else apart from the gospel. If we are to build this church, if we are to make this church strong, if this church is to remain passionate towards the Lord, we need to remain strong in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because this is what Judah is telling these people. What is being violated? The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is being violated because false teachers are denying the gospel. This is what they are denying. And he says, you know what? Build yourself in what these guys are, are, are denying. If we are to build each other in our homes, we've got to remain strong in the gospel. Remain strong in the word of God. If we are to help each other in different aspects of life and all that, our focus would be in the word of God. Our focus would be in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Nothing else but the gospel. If somebody comes to you, they realize that, you know what, seemingly my passion has diminished. You know where do you take them from? Get back to the gospel. Take them back to the gospel. That's the first step that we see. Because if you reflect on the gospel, I wonder, you know, if you sit down and reflect on the gospel, if you sit down and preach the gospel to yourself on a daily basis, I wonder if you would leave that place without loving the Lord. Because the gospel will inform you of his love. And in return, you will most definitely love the Lord. The gospel does that. So that's the first thing that we see, brothers and sisters, that if we are to keep ourselves in the love of God, a daily appropriation of the gospel is very crucial for you as an individual and for the church as well. Whether it's in our visitation, as you visit with brothers and sisters in their homes, let the central emphasis be around the gospel. Because if we miss dead people, there's no way in which we could be able to build one another. But not only do we see a daily focused communion with the gospel, but we also see a daily time of focused communion with God. Look at, look at, look at, look at, go back to verse 20 and 21. 
But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. I name that a daily time of focused communion with God. It would be more instructive at this point and most loving thing to say. I don't know how, how to motivate you in this. I don't even know how to motivate you. When you look in the scriptures as well, I don't think Demas, Demas did not just wake up one morning and make a 90 degree U10, never. This doesn't happen. Demas drafted literally by literally towards the attraction of the world. If you and I do not practice this daily focused time of communion with God, we will find ourselves also drafting in a wrong direction. If we don't spend time with the Lord people, the likelihood of drafting away from the truth, they are high. They are too high. Again, Judah places the, po the position of believers in sharp contrast with the heretics. The opponent are people who are devoid of the Holy Spirit. As you read in verse number 19, you, you learn about that, that these false teachers are devoid of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, what distinguishes the position of the Spirit and the communion with what distinguishes false teachers and true believers is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I know others at this point know people think when the Bible says praying in the Spirit, others may think of, you know, praying in tongues and whatnot, but this is not it at all, because as you look, this is a teaching that you'd find mainly in Scripture. You'll find much of this emphasis in Scripture. Praying, as you read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying all at all time in the Spirit with prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with perseverance, making mention, making supplication for all the saints. As you go as well in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. So you learn about this. You learn about this theme throughout Scripture as you read in the New Testament. Because as you go as well in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by who we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself, bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So you read this in Scripture as well. When the Bible speaks about the fact that, you know what, you pray in the Holy Spirit, it simply means, you know what, as believers, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And whatever we did, you know, one of the blessings that I've had when I was a student, I don't remember who was teaching us this, who taught this, one of the good days, and he says to us, you know what, guys, do you know that as a believer, when you sin, you are even sinning in the, in the spirit? Whatever you do, if you do something bad, think about that, because you've got the indwelling, permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So whatever you do as a believer, you are doing it in the Holy Spirit. You are doing it in the Holy Spirit. So the expression praying in the Holy Spirit does not refer to speaking in tongues, but the prayer which is consistent with the will of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to consider this, because this is where I want to hit home, right here. Consider these words from the psalmist. When you read from Psalm 63, verse 1, listen to these words. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh thirsts for you, as in dry and weary land where there's no water. I think as I'm reading those words, do you notice the intensity of these words? Like, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh thirsts for you. Brothers and sisters, this is far more than a daily Bible reading or going through every or over pray few prayer requests. Our quiet time or morning devotion or something like that. Communion with God is far more than a plan. This is a meeting with God. It is seeking God to speak to us. 
It is speaking to him as we read his word, as we interact with his word in prayer, as we pray over what God is saying to us in his word. That's communion with God. It has got nothing to do with setting time and say, let me set a few uh, minutes, maybe 30 minutes per day and doing things. You know, you do, div- you do such devotion for the sake of, of, of legalism and all that. Because you go as well in Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2, as a deep pens for a flowing stream, so pens my soul for you. O oh Lord, my soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? You read those words. You learn of a person who had such a hunger for the Lord. So that's what you need to get from this. Our communion time with the Lord should be informed by the hunger that we have for God. It's not about this legal thing that we do. Oh, yes, I did my five minutes devotion in the morning. Did you meet with the Lord? Did you hear from him as you were reading from his word? And if we are to keep ourselves in the love of God, that's what we need to do as believers. That's what we need to do as Christians. You read this as well in Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I've asked of the Lord, that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire from his temple. Listen to that. Listen to that. When we have our devotion time, our devotion time should be informed by the hunger that we have for the Lord. Are you hungry for him? Are you thirsty for him? Are you thirsty for his righteousness? Because Judah is doing that and saying, you know what? These people are doing the opposite. And as a church, if you are to keep yourself in the love of God, this is what you need to do. Daily appropriation of the gospel. Daily focused communion time with the Lord. It is helpful, brothers and sisters, to have a plan. But the plan must direct you to God himself. Do you spend time with God? Or do you just read the Bible? There's a difference between reading the Bible to spend time with God and just reading it for the sake of reading. I've said, you know what, my goal is to read about three chapters. And you know what, you are tired, you are thinking of going to bed, you are rushing everything, you just read those chapters to put a tick on it. But did you meet the Lord during that hour or during the reading of those chapters? Spending time with God certainly involves the reading of chapters or three verses or three chapters or whatever. But the objective of, what, of that is to meet with God, to have God speak to you and you respond in prayer. Prayer that is informed by that. How much time do we spend with God and what informs that particular time? Because Judah is saying that, you know what, these people are doing the opposite, are denying the gospel, and what do we do? Reflect on the gospel on a daily basis. What do you do? Make sure that you've got time to spend with the Lord on a daily basis. But not only those two, we have the last one, a daily focused on the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 21 as we do move towards Closure. But let me just start reading from verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Christians are to keep their attention fixed on the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that brings eternal life. You know, um, as I was thinking of this, I just thought of some of the resolution. One of the resolutions from Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Edwards said, resolved to live my life as if Jesus Christ is coming back today. And you know what? That's something that we are missing. Because we live as if this earth is ours forever. True eschatology keeps present reality in focus. 
just that eschatology, true eschatology, keeps present reality in focus. If we, are, we know that our Lord is coming, we will keep on. We will keep on, no matter what. Because we know Jesus is coming back. And we are waiting for that mercy. We are waiting for that mercy. We have to live with eternity in view as we eagerly anticipate the return, the Lord's return. Read, as we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to serve those who are eagerly waiting for him. Christ will come back to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What you wait for seriously makes a huge difference. What you wait for makes a huge difference. Brothers and sisters, are you not glad that we are waiting? We are not waiting for condemnation, but we are waiting for the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that we're not waiting for condemnation? We are waiting for mercy that will be revealed. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Might live with him. On the great day, all of us who have trusted in him will experience Christ's final mercy and enjoy the fullness of eternal life as we experience the resurrection and the glorification of our bodies. That's what we are looking for. That's what we're waiting for. But you know, before I close, I want to show you something. There's something quite interesting here. We were talking about you know, keeping ourselves in the love of God. I want you to, to take note of this. Because this is one of the epistles where you see the responsibility of man and God's responsibility as well. When you read in this passage, you see it clearly. Look at verse number two, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. That's number two, right? It should be verse number one. Look at verse number one. Judah, as servants of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called... Beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Do you realize that as believers, as we also do our responsibilities on earth, we are kept in Christ Jesus. We are kept for Christ. I want you to notice as well in verse number, the last verse over there, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and present you blameless before the presence of, of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now forever. Amen. If you look at verse number 24, look at that. Now to him who is able to do what? To keep you from stumbling. You, you know, there's a, there's a, when I come to this verse, most of the time as I read through this, I've preached this before, there's an illustration that happened in 2013. You know, I don't forget that picture in my mind. I always keep the, that picture in my mind. In 2013, they happened to be floods. We could not go to Mozambique to do ministry and all that. And you know what? As we failed, there were openings, opportunities in South Africa we find ourselves in a place called Endermark. When we were in Endermark, one Sunday, I was with Pastor Joseph. So one Sunday, Mama Mathauli, Mama Velemina came with Tikva. As they drove and stopped the car close to where we were, immediately when she stopped the car, Tikva just went outside of the car. And he ran on a high note. As he was running towards his father, you know what is it that happened? Pastor Joseph fixed his arms, and Tikva just jumped, and Pastor Joseph just took hold of him. This is the picture that we are being given here. In a more qualitative sense, this is the picture that we are seeing in this passage. 
Like as we run the race, as we move on a daily basis, you know what is it that we have? Underneath us, there's a fixed arm of the Lord. Do you see that? The fixed arm of God is there. It is fixed. Not once off type of an arm, continuously holding us so that we will not stumble. So as we walk in our Christian walk, be mindful of that. Because this is what the Bible is telling us, to say as we run the race, as we move forward, be taking our responsibility, God is there, God is sent is there fixed to hold us so that we will not what? Stumble. Everything that we do, is founded upon the grace of God. Thank you so much. I think we can go on and spend time in prayer.